It's a grand, great pleasure to introduce Andres Buonano, un gran amigo del instituto. Uh, Andres got his BS at Texas A&M in biochemistry. He then went back to his to Venezuela and to work at EVIC and where he got his MS, master's degree. Um, following that, he went to uh, Wash Univers Washington University in St. Louis, where he worked with John Murley, and, but also had a couple of, of our old friends on his committee, uh, Fishback and uh, Josh Sains um, at Washington University in neuroscience. Yeah. Um, from, from there, he went to uh, NIH, where he's been ever since, as an, initially as an investigator in the unit on molecular neurobiology. Um, he also hold, holds, uh, or he's presently the head of the cell, and cell biology affinity group at, at the NIH, and he holds an academic adjunct position at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, he was speaking today about neuroregulants, regulators of neuroplasticity, micro networks, and behaviors associated with psychiatric disorders. And without further introduction, welcome, Andres. Thank you, Mark. And it's a pleasure to be back here again. Um, starting to feel like home. Third time, fourth time. <laughs> so. I only get to say this in very few places, so I like to say it. Buenos dias, todo el mundo. Usually it's all in English. So um, I, I changed my talk a little bit today uh, to be able to emphasize uh, a little bit more heavily the aspects uh, that my laboratory has been working on, um, which is uh, these factors known as the regulants and how they can regulate uh, actually neuroplasticity in a, in a way that uh, is quite different than most people uh, think about plasticity being LPD or LPD. But the other thing I want to kind of exemplify as our scientific program has moved forward, and I am a basic scientist, is that as the science continued to evolve, uh, at the same time in parallel, the science and psychiatric disorders also was evolving. And it turned out that at one point, um, actually, this family of genes began, were shown to be both genetically linked, and many genes law studies have shown they've also genetically associated with the risk for schizophrenia and other persons are actually suggesting either other psychiatric disorders and even uh, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's. So through the years, the laboratory uh, has continued to do its basic science, but little by little, you can begin to see how the science began to be converged a little bit into biological processes that may be important and underlie some of the mechanisms in psychiatric disorders. And more recently, we have begun, for the first time, to collaborate with clinical labs or translational labs to try to see if we can apply some of the findings that we have observed in our experiments to uh, actually preclinical uh, experiments. And I will not have time to talk about the latter, but we can talk about it later if you wish. <laughs> so I think this information will be interesting as you're thinking about as I'm going to the talk, just to keep it in the back of your mind. Again, I don't study schizophrenia. I'm interested in basically the role of these, uh, these uh, neural developmental factors in regulating the strength of contacts, contacts between synapses and also how that affects the general network activity that underlies complex behaviors, such as some of the cognitive behaviors. So <clears throat> like uh, psychiatric disorders, not only schizophrenia, are, are usually developmental in origin and they're heritable. Uh, they're polygenic. And that's why it's been so difficult to get traction uh, understanding the mechanisms that may underlie the risk for these different psychiatric disorders. Uh, there's also clear interaction between variants, genetic variants, and the environment. So it's not only the genes, but it's also not only the environment. It's very clear from family studies that there is a clear genetic component, and schizophrenia can be as high as a 60 to 70 percent increased risk if you come from a family that has not only schizophrenia, but interestingly, there are certain disorders that run within families, such as bipolar and ADHD. Now, in the case of schizophrenia in particular, but it's also true for many of these other disorders, 
you find there's been several neurotransmitter systems being uh, involved. In particular, dopamine comes up uh, very frequently. And the reason predominantly is that most antipsychotics used up to date actually uh, target uh, dopamine receptors, in particular D2 and D3 receptors. But there's actually very little evidence that the dopamine receptors may be involved in the etiology of these disorders. Two competing other uh, hypotheses that are important perhaps for the etiology of these disorders, in particular schizophrenia, have been what's known as the hypoglutamatergic theory in schizophrenia. And that's where they've shown that antagonists of the NMDA receptor, such as ketamine, can induce, when used acutely, many of what's called the positive symptoms, psychosis, for example, that are very similar to the psychosis you observe in schizophrenia. And if you use it for long term, it actually also begins to develop, uh, patients begin to develop, or subjects begin to develop, symptoms that look very much like the negative, lack of effect, uh, for example, personality issues, and also cognitive deficits that are prominent in this disorder. Um, the third hypothesis, which is the newer one now, has also uh, has to do with divergent transmission. What's been observed in many postmortem studies of a uh, schizophrenic brain is that there is a reduction of a particular type of interneuron in the function it's affected, mainly in areas that involve areas involved with cognition, cognitive behaviors. And that is what's known as the Harveyman positive or the fast spiking GABAergic interneuron. These are interneurons that can fire at extremely high rates and they are absolutely necessary for being able to induce a type of network activity known as gamma oscillations that are thought to be involved or underlie many of the processes that you use, like, for example, working memory. And you can't really isolate all these from each other because, for, for example, to generate gamma oscillations, all these systems interact with each other. And it's known, for example, that while dopamine is not important for inducing a gamma oscillation, it can certainly regulate its set point where they're interested. So, as I said earlier, um, uh, genome association studies and genetic literature studies consistently find that there are gene variants that encode proteins involved in synaptic plasticity. That is a very, it was one of the most common findings you find in the genome-wide studies. And interestingly, these include the regular model or the core. Now, I just mentioned a couple minutes ago, neuro, uh, a type of neural network activity known as the gamma oscillations uh, are found in patients, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are found that these gamma oscillations are affected. Interestingly, it's not so much that it's the power of these oscillations that are affected, but more that patients tend to have an increased background of gamma, and it's thought that perhaps that is one of the problems they have in being able to, uh, be able to dissociate salient versus non-salient stimuli. And I just mentioned here that the loss of Fast spiking uh, parabenic positive interneurons is important because it regulates this excitatory inhibitory balance that is very critical for the generation of these oscillations. So, what are the neuregulants? The neuregulants are proteins that are synthesized as transmembrane proteins. I've simplified this a bit for, for today's talk. But the important part of the molecules here in red, known as the EGF like domain, these are related to EGF, it's part of the same superfamily. And they're synthesized, I said, as one transmembrane protein, or in some cases, two transmembrane proteins by using different promoters. And I don't have time to speak today, but a lot of our research now is showing, because we've known that these different forms of norreglin are actually uh, exist not only in rodents, but in humans and throughout evolution. And, and, the, and the significance of why you have these different types of norreglins has never been clear. And for the first time we're showing, and that's one of the things I showed in that first picture, is that these types of neuregulins are actually are targeted to one place of the cell. They're targeted to the somatic part of the inhibitory neurons, while these neuregulins here are actually transported down axons. Now, neuregulins are also activity-dependent factors. So when you activate the cells, they actually get cleaved by base 1, one of the shedases, Actually, if you follow the, uh, a the APP story, it's exactly the same enzyme that uh, actually cuts APP. And they're also cut in the membrane by gamma secretase. When that happens, these forms of neuregulins can be released and act at their distance, while these other neuregulins here are actually cleaved, and they, it, these are um, signal in a juxtaphy 
prime manner, and in the peripheral nervous system, it is this type of neuroagulin that regulates your myelination. So <clears throat> this is just summarizing what I said. So when you release it, these can act on herb receptors or on cell bodies, and these can act on herb receptors that are either in peripheral targets or in Schwann's cells or liver dendrocytes. Now, these factors then combine to these receptor tires and kinases known as ERB receptors. And for today's talk, the only important thing is that neuroagulins can bind ERB3 or ERB4. And most of my talk will focus on ERB4 because that is the predominant neuronal receptor. Um, and we showed several years ago, and it's really what got us to begin to study the role of this pathway of plasticity, that ERB4 has a C-terminal tail that interacts with PSD, PSD95 agglutinatergic synapses. Okay. So we began then to analyze the potential role that neuroagulants could have in regulating an activity-dependent process known as long-term potentiation. So we used the, the most known structure which, uh, to study LPP, which is the hippocampus. I would like to stress, however, that even though historically LTP has been thought as a mechanism that was more specific to the hippocampus and that occurred only in glutamatergic synapses between the Schaefer collaterals and these in the CA1 glutamatergic neurons, it is today appreciated that LTP is a very general mechanism. It occurs in different transmitter systems. There are people in this room that actually have looked at that. And uh, it also happens in many different parts of the brain. So when I think of LPP these days, and I think now even Rob Belenka, which was one of, was one of the very strong believers, this is more a hippocampal associative mechanism, I think most people now believe that basically LPP is a very kind of general mechanism that happens to strengthen synaptic connections in response to correlated activity. Why is the correlated activity important in the case of uh, unimatergic synapses? Because when a stimulus comes, it causes the release of glutamate from these vesicles, and in baseline situations, it can bind and open AMPA receptors to allow a current to come into the postsynaptic cell. But there's another receptor that sits on the synapse, and it's the NMDA receptor. The NMDA receptor at resting potentials actually has a magnesium molecule that blocks the currents. So unless you stimulate this synapse very strong, as you can do for a use of RTP using a theta burst stimulus, you do not get the calcium to the NDA receptor that is critical for the induction of LTP. Now, because I'm going to show a lot of slides in LTP, and I don't know how much of the audience is familiar with it, I'm going to take this one uh, slide to kind of go through it very briefly so you understand what we're plotting. So again, we, are, we measured uh, basically LTP at the Schaefer collateral, which is a glutamatergic synapse, onto these glutamatergic CA1 neurons. Um, by stimulating these collaterals and reporting for these cells. And the reason we did that is because we knew the regulin was expressed in these fibers that come in this direction and that it could be released in response to activity. So normally what you do is you basically record from the cell, you put a first stimulus in baseline, now you get the theta burst stimulus, and please remember it's TBS, it's a burst, you need a burst. And if you look later, what you find is that there's an increase from there to there, this difference is a potentiated synapse. Why is it called long-term? It's called long-term because this is baseline, you stimulate, and now this will remain potentiated for even days. And there's even experiments that have gone out to weeks and months. And this is why this correlated activity is so critical and was thought to be so critical for spatial memory in the hippocampus. There is, as any biological system, there's the other side to the coin, which is LTD. This one is induced by uh, basically using these long, lower frequency stimuli. And when you plot that, you can see that's a reduction of the baseline which long term. The only problem with this mechanism, you hear a lot about it, is that these experiments can only be observed extremely early in development. You don't find at least this type of LTD in animals after two weeks of age. So what is then the next, what could be another homeostatic mechanism that could basically prevent all your synapses from becoming potentiated and not have kind of a dynamic range. And that is a phenomenon that Gary Lynch described many years ago known as depotentiation. What this is, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a very brief stimulus, just a, like a little zap for one second, that on its own is not enough to produce LPP, 
But what it can do, it can completely reverse LPP in a time-dependent fashion. So, and it, it's been shown that these kinds of stimuli that even actually work in vivo in animals that they're exploring, and you give a TPS, they actually kind of lose track where they were. They forget what they were exploring. So it's a way that you can reverse LPP and maybe keep it more static. So we began to look at the effects of norregulin, again, because we thought it could be uh, affecting plasticity. And the first experiment we did was this one, and we went, oh, time to go home is not, is not it. Because you put norregulin in a vehicle, and there's absolutely no effect on this synaptic current. Remember, this is basically an AMPA current that you're looking for. We then went in and said, well, because it's an activity-dependent factor, perhaps activity is important. So we did this other experiment. This is just an example in the field. Uh, I'll take it, it, it involved the rest, I believe I'm going to show you is actually now in a whole cell voltage plant. What you find is that you produce LPP. Here's the, if you give vehicle afterwards, it's very nice and constant. But if you take and you produce LPP and give as little as one nanomolar in a regulant, you can very, very effectively completely reverse LPP. So this is the expressive. Uh, yes, thank you for saying that. The opposite. Yes. So this is a small peptide, so it could go into the slice that only contains the EGF-like name. So I will address why that's a problem and how we have addressed it. No, uh, it doesn't appear. I think the next slide that I'll show will actually address probably the more the mechanism, but it, it does not appear to be a dominant mechanism. Um, so it's very effective, basically, of bringing you back to, to baseline. And these experiments were actually done in animals that were older because we wanted to make sure that when we interpret our data, there was not a confoundment that maybe we had a partial LTD, for example. And when you look at how this effect is mediated, it's consistent with the literature. And that is, when you add norregulin, what you potentiate is the AMPA component, not the NMDA. So you remember, you need NMDA for the induction of LTP, but you need AMPA receptors for the expression of LTP, in other words, to contain that high level. And then what we find is if you add norregulin, this component is reduced selective. So we wanted to address how this may be working, and also because, obviously, we're taking norregulin and throwing it into a slice, and there's always a question, does this really even happen in vivo? So to do this, we had to address this using uh, knockout mice. And uh, the problem with the knockouts, is the ERB4 knockout and the ERB3, is that they die early in development because the ERB receptors are also involved in the trabeculation of the heart. So a way to circumvent that was to cross these mice, knockout mice, with a mouse that expresses ERB4 only in the heart. And when you do that, to be frank with you, to my absolute surprise, these animals actually survive, and we can use them as adults. So what we found first, to respond to part of that question, is we took these mice and uh, compared it to the litter mates. So there's a litter mate, you add a regular one, but when you add it to an ERB4 knockout, the effect is absolutely gone. Moreover, you can already see it here, but you can see here more clearly where we actually interleave uh, different acute slices and measured LTP because it's hard to compare from slice to slice. We found that LTP is actually increased in these slices of ERB4 knockouts. And now this has been reproduced by two other groups. And third, what we found is that, remember I showed you earlier, TPS can actually reverse LTP. So this is a slice that's gotten TPS and it reverses back down. If you do a knockout mouse from uh, early 4, it goes down transiently and then it recovers. And I don't have time to show you, but we've used different paradigms. We just call a double stimulation paradigm. We've been able to show that this affects our homosynaptic. In other words, the effect is, it is, is only happening in the cells that are stimulated. And this LPP basically recovers to its original level. So somehow you have masked the capacity for this postsynaptic cell. So everything was going fine. Everything looked really good. We were going to go and start finding what is the mechanism in these postsynaptic cells that may be regulating this process. And based on the literature, the obvious thing would have been to look at AMPA receptor phosphorylation. What is the behavior of the device? Sorry? The behavior of the device. Oh, I'm going to go to it a little bit later. If you don't mind it, for what so, so basically what these results indicate is that ERB4 is absolutely necessary in, a, in, the, in that basically the deregulants could be playing a role for maintaining homeostatic, uh, homeostatic responses in CNN. 
So up to that point, our data was highly based on the distribution of RB4, an antibody that everybody else was using, our favorite company, Santa Cruz. And here's the antibody right here. And look what happens. And now that we have the mock-up, we can really test these antibodies. And what, it, what you find is that every, we tried at least eight batches of Santa Cruz. I must admit, the earlier batches were better than this. But, but nevertheless, it marks the right protein at about 180. But it also hits its other bands. And if you look, what people thought is, well, you have higher expression in these interneurons, but it's also on these CA1 cells. So you know, we thought we're going to look at CA1. Then we decided to look at that more carefully. And to do that, we produced our own monoclonal antibody. We actually produced a rapid monoclonal antibody. Now, in contrast to that, you can see this marks a single band, no other bands, and in the knockout, absolutely gone. Then we scan that on sections from the knockout in the wild type, and now you can see the expression is restricted to the GABAergic neurons, and it's not expressed in CA1. To show that something is negative is hard. So we did a whole bunch of experiments. I'll tell you verbal because I don't want to bore you to death. We did single cell PCR. We used ERB4 pre mice that we crossed to tomato reporter mice, but every method that we looked, and people did not want to hear this because there were very good publications in neuron and nature medicine in many places where they proposed that the effect was happening directly in the student church itself. And what we were able to show, and here again, using a double staining, RB4 is expressed in these cells that are negative for neurogranin. Neurogranin in this area marks glutamate church cells. Absolutely no overlap. If you look here with GAP67, you can see nice labeling into these cells, these GABAergic cells, which are mainly these fast spiking interneurons. It's basically the receptor restricted to the soma and the dendrites of the cell. So clearly, this was not the way it was happening. So we knew from part behaviors were already starting to hit it to us that these animals may have a disbalance in dopamine. And we knew from the situ hybridization we had done before, and this is just an example from that I took directly from because it's easier to show it from the from the animal atlas. We knew that the message was here in the area of the VTA and the mesencephalic area of the statue nigra, where we know there's little of cells. The problem is that there was also inhibitory cells here, so we couldn't really differentiate between the two. So we then did, we then adopted this new methodology that I can talk to you guys more if you want about it later. It's known as RNA scope. It's a great way to do a CTR hybridization with multiple colors, and by doing this, we were able to confirm that ERB4 indeed is expressed in Th positive uh, Th positive dopaminergic neurons. And there was presence that indeed the VTA sends projections to the hippocampus and also to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, it also sends others to the nucleus accumbens, but it, it, the one that sends to the basal ganglion nucleus accumbens is mainly the uh, substantial nigra. So we, uh, we wanted to then consider the possibility that it could be regulation by, uh, by dopamine. So we were able to demonstrate, and we only demonstrated this to be frankly just recently, finally, that processes, axonal processes, from dopaminergic neurons expressed through before. And this was a surprise to us because we spent a lot of time looking at GABAergic neurons, and in GABAergic neurons, we could not find evidence in the axons. And uh, we have a story that's developing right now where the cells appear to express different splice variants, and these splice variants actually can go down the axon. So, <clears throat> to test this functionally, we collaborated with Luis Hernandez in the Universidad de Los Andes uh, in Venezuela, who is a neurochemist. And we carried out these experiments. And I really want to thank Luis. I want to thank Daniel here because these experiments were really, really hard. The amount of dopamine that projects to the hippocampus is really minimal compared, for example, to the basal ganglia. It's about 100 fold less. So it is extremely difficult to measure dopamine. That's problem number one. Problem number two, most of the measurements for dopamine and metabolites are done in about 10, 15 minute binges of collection binges. I didn't like that because I wanted to see if we could study it in shorter time points to be able to see if there were changes in dopamine that they actually would perceive the changes in the reversal of the LTP. So we actually have to do these experiments where we would run the rats and then collect time points and then pool them so we could collect enough to measure it. They were measured by HPLC and electrochemical methods. We were confirmed later also by mass spec. And what we found was that by using reverse microanalysis, what you do is you basically come in, put this probe in the hippocampus of live moving rats, and now we do it in mice. You bring in an oregano, one animal in an oregano, and at the same time you can collect 
all the extracellular material out here, and we can analyze that for dopamine and other neurotransmitters. And what we found was that as soon as we could put them the right limit, by the first point, and these now are now two-minute bins. I don't think anybody has ever done this. Just to, it's really very, very, uh, very time and technically consuming experiment. We could see there was this huge increase in extracellular dopamine by the first time for we could look. If we use this chemical small molecule known as PD158780, this is a general ERV blocker because we didn't have the mice at that time that we were doing this in rat. And we could see that that could block almost all of this increase in the by neuroregulin. There's a little bit left over. I don't know the reason, but I think the reason is that PD is actually very lipophilic and it takes a while to get into the cells because it, it binds to the kinase domain that's inside the cell. And here's the vehicle. So you can see that neuroregulin causes this massive increase in dopamine very quickly. Now, now that we had the mice, we wanted to ask, is that increase in dopamine mediated through the ERB3 or ERB4 receptors? And we knew that ERB4 was in, in the solid by tropicalization. We could not see ERB3. So we used these again, these knockouts, these are full knockouts. And we found, here's the neuroregulin, here's the increase that we see in the wild type. Now we're doing these in mice. They're much harder. We go to the 15 minute pin collections, so these are experiments can be done. And what we found was that if you use the ERB4 knockout, that effect is totally gone. Now, why is it gone? We were concerned. Well, it could be gone because the cells didn't migrate. It could be gone because the processes didn't go out to the hippocampus. We knew the cells were there. We could not see any differences. So we carried this experiment where we wash out in the regular and followed this with a pulse of KCL to depolarize the terminals. And what we find is that indeed these terminals are there and they still have the capacity to release dopamine. But when you're doing the dialysis and you're repeating the regimen, you don't really know whether you're activating your memory functionality. Uh, These are the processes. The neurons are not there. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's processes. They are, they're activating a whole bunch of other things that might be maybe. Yes. We will get yeah, to that. We will get to that. I totally agree. <laughs> but I will tell you that we, we, we looked at other neuromodulators. We looked at norepinephrine, which is very heavy. We looked at serotonin. And to be frank with you, if I was going to make a choice of who was doing this, it would never have been dopamine. It would have been norepinephrine if I had a choice. But I'll show you. you keep asking me because we have gone out of our way to show that this is not norepinephrine, number one. Norepinephrine actually increases after, after dopamine. And, and second, there's this idea also where you can maybe have double transmitters be released by a single cell. We've actually also now have done experiments with that. I don't remember if I have slides to show that, but again, it does not fit that, that interpretation. So basically the way we decided then to approach this is, is to try to dissect where is this effect coming from. And now what we did is we had early four, early four flux mass. This is the one I showed you earlier. This knocks out everywhere. It's a chronic deletion, knocks out everywhere. So we targeted the expression uh, to PD, CRE, GABAergic neurons, which are the ones that express most of were before, or to these TH positive neurons that hit the mononeurgic cells. And then we've also now developed uh, AADs uh, that actually can express it before so we can rescue it. This was extremely difficult. That the full horse in the lab did this. It took us many years because the, we are really at the limit of the size of the AAD. It's a, it's a 5 kE transcript. So we have to gut all the, the AADs little by little until we can basically get the ERB4 going. So now using these mice, what we find is that if you add an irregulin uh, and you do this reverse microdialysis in mice that have knocked out ERB4 and PV neurons, an irregulin can still cause its increment in extracellular dopamine. But in contrast, right, we see that only in these mice we can see that if you knock out ERB4 from TH neurons, that you, can, you now completely knock, out, knock away this activity in the regulum to increase extracellular dopamine levels. And the reason that was important is because you could visualize a situation where you could have a dopaminergic terminal that's under inhibition, and so maybe it still could be happening in an indirect way. This indicates this effect is directly on these TH neurons. Moreover, uh, this will begin to address some of your questions. Uh, we did a rescue experiment, uh, and I was really amazed this work. This is one experiment where don't listen to your mentor and do the experiment if you think it's a good one. Uh, Miguel did this experiment. I, I, I really didn't think this was going to work. And what he did is he injected a A and B expressed before into the VTA area, 
and then compared that to one that was injected with AAVGFP, and what we found was the AAVGFP could not rescue the effects of the regulum, but expression of ERB4 in this encephalic area could rescue the effects of the regulum on this release of dopamine. So, uh, and we looked into locus aurelius and injected with the locus aurelius could not see that. So, these are very preliminary experiments that I'm showing here. These are in progress, so they're not as, as you can see immediately, they're not as, as nice as the previous ones. But we wanted them to ask, is it sufficient then to knock out ERB4 from TH neurons and affect the effects of neuroculum? And what we found was that indeed, knocking out ERB4 appears to show, like I said, this is still very, very, very noisy, but you can see that neuroculum cannot reverse the uh, LPP in these mice. And if you look, compared to liver mates, you can even see that, that uh, LPP is actually somewhat increased in these mice. Remember TPS that I told you about. So TPS are these brief stimuli that you give that are thought to be correlated with kind of salient stimuli. And it's known that salient stimuli cause an increment in dopamine. So now we're not adding the regular. Now what we're doing is just simply stimulating with uh, LPP and giving this TPS. And what you can see is, here's the wild type controls and they go down and remain down. In the knockouts, they come down and it recovers back up again. So this is indicating that in the endogenous system, TPS is working through an ERB4 mediated pathway. And so just to summarize what I've told you is uh, basically neuroglin is expressed in these dopaminergic cells and these gaba neurons. The initial idea, and what most people thought, is that this was a direct effect of neuroglin and ERB4 receptors expressed in human neutrogenic synapses. Let me tell you why there was part of the confusion, amazingly enough. We had shown that ERB4 interacted with PSD95, not the glutamatergic synapse. Everybody's thinking is, oh, that's a glutamatergic synapse. So ERB4 is on all glutamatergic synapses. No. ERB4 is on glutamatergic synapses on inhibitory neurons, not in excitatory synapses on excitatory neurons. So that hypothesis is out. We show that also this is not an indirect going through the GABA receptors in GABAergic cells, but instead these effects on neuroglin are mediated through an indirect way going to the dopaminergic neurons. So how is the effect mediated? Okay, you said something about well, DPS, like is it anything about it? DPS. Yeah, there's very little about <laughs> DPS. This is what I'm pretty excited about. Um, the TPS literature to me is, uh, let me go. One step back. So you can depotentiate LPP by different methods. So one method, actually the most popular, if you look at depotentiation in PubMed, most people use LFS, low frequency stimulus. The reason I don't like the low frequency stimulus, first of all, I don't know of any animal that sits around and receives inputs for 15 minutes. It's just constant. And that's what LFS. Second, it leads to this question about is this more like LTD or is it more you know, is this really LTD or is this really the potentiation? What I like about TPS, it's just a brief stimulus. It won't produce LTP, it will not produce LTP on its own. The groups that have proposed molecular mechanism underlying I am suspect of, because basically what they suggested were all the mechanisms that you see in LTD. And they were using LFS. So right now, Deep potentiation is beginning to have a resurgence again, and, and Michael Rowan, in, in, uh, I think he's at Oxford, has been looking now at uh, looking at at least behavioral-wise what how TPS is, is, is working, and I think that I've spoken with him, and he finds that it's what I'm showing here is not inconsistent at all with the idea that this goes to a dopamine-dependent mechanism and may be activating phosphatases that deforce the amyloid receptors on the excitatory noise. And we are very interested in that because what I'm going to tell you now is what we feel is downstream of that building. I think the yeah. TPS is with the same electrode that's producing the LTP? Um, we've done it both ways. Uh, we've done it with both ways. So you can do it with the same electrode, but yes, that's the way that you normally do it. Okay, it's just a different path. It's just a different path. It's very, very brief. It's one second, a theta burst frequency, a theta, 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 theta a theta pattern, a theta pattern for one second. But on its own, it basically doesn't change basal synaptic transmission at all. 
So it only does it if you've already been potentiated. So, so then the question is, how is how can we this effect be mediated? And so this is so we, we began to consider the D1D2s. Um, and if you work on LTP and you follow groups like Eric and Dell and many other groups, you already would be shaking your head going, this guy is totally wrong. We've known for years that that dopamine is a pro-LTP uh, pathway, not in reversal of LTP or not an anti-LTP. And here's where it becomes very key. All the evidence that dopamine regulates LTP refers to late phase LTP. And what I told you earlier, TPS and aregulin only affect early phase LTP. So that's a very, very, very major difference. But we still wanted to consider all the receptors when we, when we looked at dopamine. So we considered both the D1, D type, which are positively coupled to cyclic P&P, which would increase PKA, which would be phosphorylated ample receptors put into the synapse, or the opposite one, that basically work by basically lowering the level of cyclic P&P, dephosphorylating the receptors and causing their internalization. And the reason this is important in the context that we're talking about today, this is the major site of antipsychotics, actually, as I told you earlier. So there would be a lot of interest in that. So first we found, uh, showed that at least postsynaptically in the hippocampus, and consistent with the literature, there's expression of D1, D5. Uh, there's expression of D2 and a lower effect and lower levels of D4, both in the frontal cortex and hippocampus. Please note that this is a logarithmic scale, so there is actually quite, quite a bit lower of, of D4 receptors in the hippocampus. So we went at this pharmacologically initially. This is what I've shown you earlier. The black is uh, a slice of vehicle, another slice with the regular goes down. If you now pre, uh, pre incubate the slice of D1, D5 antagonist, and you put in the regulin, you see that the regulin's effect is still fine. And if you look closely, you can see that there's actually this rundown. This is the rundown that you would expect in the later phases of LTP that were described by John Lisman and also be consistent with Eric Kendall's effects of the role of D1, D5 in LTP stabilization. We then tried uh, antagonists for D2, D3. I should emphasize that we were very careful going to literature and using doses of inhibitors that were logical. And unfortunately, when you look through the literature, one of the biggest problems of confusion is people use huge amounts of an antagonists where the whole specificity of the antagonist is lost. So we actually are working at nanomolar, 50, 100 nanomolar, not micromolar, as most people use at 10 micromolar. None of these drugs have specificity for any of the receptors. So when you try D2D3 sulfide here, you can see the regulin still works fine. But in complete contrast, if you use an antagonist for D4, this was used at 100, I believe, nanomolar level, the effect of the regulin is totally gone. We used two other structurally independent compounds that target D4, got exactly the same result. And interesting, again, with the, now with the idea of the C's in mind, we tried clozapine. Clozapine was originally, you know, it's been known for many, many years, but it's one of the most efficacious drugs that you can treat for schizophrenia. The problem is it's got secondary effects that are very dangerous. That's why it's not used in the United States. But it's one of the most efficacious. And it does have different targets, but its favorite target for dopamine is actually D4. And that's part, that is the reason why all these companies made these wonderful inhibitors and agonists for D4, and it turned out that it doesn't cure schizophrenia. But the point is that clozapine and all these other drugs also could block the norepinephrine one. And this affects, if you look now at a dopamine receptor agonist, also occur by the reversal of the AMPA component of the LTP. So we finally were able then to get our hands on the D4 knockout mouse, and we were able to show that in the D4 knockout mouse, the regular uh, effects are totally blocked. So these results that indicate then that um, now we can add to this figure here that the effects of dopamine onto these leukotriging cells are going to a D4 receptor. We don't know yet, and I'd like to show this genetically, and we're working on that right now, that this effect is directly on D4 expressed on these cells, because D4, in my hands, is one of the lowest receptors we have ever measured by PCR, by protein. There's not an antibody out there that's specific. We've gone through seven. All seven have failed. Uh, it is extremely, extremely low, uh, and it's very hard to see, but we were able to get one antibody to work at least semi-decently, and as I'll show you in a minute, uh, D4 has its highest expression in ERB4 positive cells, 
but it is unclear. Uh, it is uh, either very low in these blue matrix cells, so these effects could either be direct or indirect, and we, we, I'll need to tell you the story later to find out if it goes through that system. Okay, so I'd like to now change gears and go to the second part of the talk, and that is focusing more now on the herbivore expression on these GABAergic neurons and its potential role in, in, in its role in network, in regulating network activity. So even though I'm going to show you our experiments from our lab have all been done in the hippocampus, it's easier to explain the concept using the prefrontal cortex. Uh, we have some experiments now before the cortex, the same effects are observed on gamma oscillations. It is that gamma oscillations are, are, are produced basically by an interaction between GABAergic fast spiking interneurons that innervate the cell bodies of excitatory neurons, and then also a feed forward system of inhibition that basically can generate oscillations at, at 30 to 80 hertz. As I told you earlier, these are associated with attention and are known to also be uh, regulated. Um, the, the, the frequency of these can be regulated uh, by, uh, by dopamine. So you can see here a scan, you can see the peak at around 30 hertz, and then the, uh, these these uh, levels of the gamma oscillations can be uh, regulated in there and by dopamine. I just want to refresh your memory that ERB4 is indeed expressed in these GABAergic fast spiking basket cells. And what we found then was that if we took and looked at gamma oscillations and acute slices mediated by kinase, they're called kinase induced gamma oscillations, so you can get the, you can get the slice to oscillate. If you add the regulin, you see this huge increase in the amplitude of these oscillations. You can see here in red versus that in black. And we know that these require ERB4 because if you do the same experiment and slice from the ERB4 knockout, that peak is absolutely gone. Moreover, if you look at the endogenous, not the regulin produced, but if you look at the endogenous gamma oscillations, they're reduced by at least 60%. So we were interested now that we knew there was this crosstalk between dopamine and ERB4. We were interested in looking at the possibility, this is the experience that showed that the regulin can increase the gamma oscillation. We were interested to see if there could be a crosstalk with a dopaminergic system. And I don't have time to go through all the experiments, so I'm just going to summarize it here. What we were able to show was that if you now induce gamma oscillations with the regulin, but instead of blocking with an ERB receptor inhibitor, you block with a D4 receptor inhibitor, you can completely reverse that. D2, D3 inhibitors, D1, D5 inhibitors do not do this. And you can use clozapine and you get basically the same effect. We were able to find, and this is what I was telling you earlier, this is the best we can do. This is an antibody we're able to recover. I believe it's from Patricia Pascal's or Keith's lab after it was in a freezer for 15 years. We we're able to get some of the dry material and affinity purified. You can see it's here in these scavenged neurons. And what we find is that D4 receptors, ERB4, are co-expressed in a subpopulation of PD positive neurons, and we quantified that, you can see here. So what is interesting about this is, as I'll now try to stress towards the end of my talk, is that we are finding that there is a convergence of these signaling pathways in these fast spiking GABAergic interneurons that perhaps could underlie how they function to regulate uh, different, uh, gamma oscillation power. And we have started experiments to try to understand if these then could be very uh, special targets for cognitive deficits that are associated with different psychiatric disorders. So this is just to summarize what I just said. If you have these GABAergic PD neurons where this systems actually converge, where they can regulate both plasticity and gamma oscillations. So uh, we finally got to, uh, I'm going to, I just picked a couple of behaviors we have done, many, many more behaviors, but just to address your question about what we see behavior-wise. So again, what we did in this case was then to take the ERB4 full knockouts. These are chronic. These are, these are basically knocked out everywhere. And compare their effects on behaviors uh, in these knockouts that are where we knock out in these GABAergic neurons versus those where we knock out in the TH3. And we've got a lot of surprises on this study here. So one of the tests that we did was open field tests is where you look at the activity of the mice. The idea, uh, at least for people that try to model traits, you really can let me also emphasize this, you cannot really imitate a schizophrenic mouse. That doesn't exist. What you can do, however, is that there are particular behavioral traits that can be modeled fairly well. They've been studied by creating lesion, looking at drug effects, where you can get some ideas of their relevance 
to what is also known as endophenotypes of the disorder. So one of the ones, one of the tests is just to look at, at, at how active or uh, how, uh, how active the mouse is in the open field. It is thought that this correlates with the positive aspects of schizophrenia. And what we found was that in, in the case of the floor before knockout, these animals are actually hyperactive. This is also true if you knock out herb before in inhibitory neurons. Um, uh, and uh, you can see here the cumulative distance. But interestingly, we did not find an effect in the animal that we knocked out herb before in the TH neurons. And we can go to that at the beginning of the discussion if you wish it. We have some ideas of why that may be. We also looked at a test uh, known as preflux inhibition. And what preflux inhibition is, I go two stimuli. So normally, if I give you one stimulus, you're ready for the second. So your response to the first is actually a little bit higher than to the second because you inhibit that response. Shown here, or graphically, pulse, you get a, you get a pulse, but if you give a pre-pulse, usually then you get an inhibition of that startle as shown right here. And, and that is actually an assay that was developed originally to look at sensory motor responses in patients that have schizophrenia. And it was found that they have a deficit in being able to inhibit that response. And so this was modeled in different animals, and, and, and so basically used in the lab. And you can find that in these early form lookout mice, there's actually also an inhibition of this response to startle. In the PD mice, uh, we've done less of these this far, but we also see that there appears to be, at least at these lower levels, there appears to be a significant effect, but not as strong as you can see it were before. Again, we were quite surprised that we did not see a difference in the TH pre mice. And we believe the reason, maybe, but we haven't shown this experimentally, is that we believe that the ERV4 expressing cells are actually being targeted to areas that are not associated necessarily with these responses. And, that we, and what we find is actually that these mice see, have a deficit of uh, dopamine, actually dopamine, in their cortex and hippocampus. So they're hypodopaminergic in cortical So what we try to do is use uh, one test that actually uh, looks a little bit at cognitive uh, behaviors. We have other tests that we're doing now that are much more complicated. This is basically a spontaneous alternation task. And the idea is that the mice basically requires both spatial as well as kind of a short-term memory to be able to remember to alternate in these arms. And what we found was that, again, the ERV4 knockouts now show a deficit on this. Uh, ERV4 knockouts in TH neurons show a deficit, no change for the PD neurons in this case. So that would suggest that perhaps this, that this behavior that requires interaction between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex might be affected, and that is why this is affecting the pH mice. So we went in and rescued the mice. I've already showed you this before. This is where we rescued an before full mouse with the before. This is just showing you what I, what I just showed you, that there is a deficit on the spontaneous alteration. And if you now rescue the mice, you actually can rescue the behavior on this alternating test. And I don't have here the picture, but I'll just tell you something that's interesting to be observed. We don't know the, the significance yet. We also can knock out herb 4 in selected areas by adding an AAV cream mouse into an herb 4 flux mouse. And when we acutely mutate herb 4 instead of chronically through development, what we find is that this performance even goes down lower. Now, this takes a little while. You have to do this to kind of capture why this is very, very strange. 50% means you just guessed, basically. I, I will left, I'll go right, chance. These animals are scoring at 25%. So this goes back to the idea that I tried to push earlier, that maybe, going back to part of your question, what may be a rule, is that the animals appear to show persevering behaviors. And so what we leave, which would be consistent, perhaps, with the role in LPP, is that basically you change the connections that are formed between different areas of the brain, and one of the possibilities could be that that can result in persevering life behaviors. And this experiment, I'll finish off with this experiment here, but just basically two experiments here, and then I'll summarize, just showing that we, um, uh, this is not a mouse that I've talked about today, but it also shows very similar things to TH3 mouse, that there is a 
decrement in this uh, spontaneous alternation. We actually followed the levels of dopamine, uh, either injecting the vehicle or clozapine, and clozapine is known to be able to increase acutely dopamine levels in the brain. And what we found was that clozapine could rescue also in these mice the, uh, the, uh, the, the performance in these tests. And interesting, what you see is we inject here, and we normally perform the test right there. So interestingly, it's when the dopamine appears to reach, it's a coincidence, it maybe, but it's, it correlates, that when dopamine reaches levels in the prefrontal cortex that are similar to wild type, the performance begins to become similar. So what we have found, just to summarize then, is that different early before knockouts actually have different behaviors, and this list is now almost like 10, 10 different behaviors, but they show many similarities with other animal models for schizophrenia. And in particular, the one that I think is important is this ketamine model that I told you earlier, because it's, it, it really is one of the favorite models for modeling behaviors in mice that are similar to humans. And ketamine is also used in clinical investigations where it's been shown in sub-threshold uh, sub, uh, levels that can actually affect cognitive behaviors. And you can do this under an fMR and actually look at the brain activity of the dorsal prefrontal cortex. And so what has been shown is, as I said earlier, is that um, basically uh, ketamine can increase basal gamma isolation power similar to neuroglin. It can also affect extracellular dopamine levels. It also affects gur 2 b containing and MDA receptors. I didn't have time to talk about that today. But we also have evidence that this is what the neuroglin early four pathway is doing. So I'd like to finish with this kind of working hypothesis. And this is where we kind of like to continue, is that these GABAergic neurons here, have a series of signaling pathways that converge right in these cells. And you have D4 receptors, early 4 receptors. I, like I said, I didn't have time to show, but actually we can show that these cells also express neuroregulants that cause a downregulation of NMDA receptors, and it's known that NMDA receptors also regulate the power of these gamma oscillations. So that we believe then that this cell, this particular cell target could be very critical for being able to perhaps be able to modulate cognitive, uh, cognitive activity in, uh, in patients. And so we've already started uh, some experiments in collaborators with other labs, some preclinical studies, to try to see if the D4 uh, um, agonists can have an effect that are pro-cognitive in behaviors. Uh, and the reason we can do that is because those drugs have already passed clinical trials. They were shown to be ineffective in being able to treat all the spectrum disorders of schizophrenia, but they were never tested to look at the potential to treat cognitive deficits. So this is the kind of the goal that we wanted to. So I'll just finish then by saying, and summarizing the entire talk here, is that we believe that these receptors are involved in the generation of these gamma oscillations, that there's a distribution of these receptors in different areas of these circuits that can generate these gamma oscillations that are so important for cognitive behaviors, and that if there's a reduction or a decrease, or there's different variants of these receptors, it can lead to a dyssynchrony of these different gamma oscillations, which would involve, which basically reduce gamma power, which would then have very big effects on behavior. So this is my laboratory. I believe I mentioned most people here in my lab, in, in my lab uh, and the work they, they've done. I also want to acknowledge uh, collaborations that we have with Lisa Hernandez. Uh, some of the terms we're looking at the Dutch the bedside is John Crystal and Phil Corlett. We have a collaboration looking with Jess Carden in vivo now at the effects of this pathway in gamma oscillations, and also with a clinical lab of David Lewis at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Questions? So the uh, okay, so so gamma sequences um, based we. Is in a rail in all these effects that you were showing were with this extracellular peptide. When you started your introduction, you immediately started thinking about notch, <laughs> which also works in the same way. So exactly. Well, any intracellular effects with the regulating of we, we haven't had a chance to look at that. We've been dying to look at that because you know, if I would pick a if I would pick a signaling pathway that most reminds me of this is the lot notch region. It's it's almost yeah. They're side by side. Yeah. It, they're so, so similar. We, we have plans. I mean, if I had the resources, the way that would be one of the things we would love to be able to do. So what are the neuroregulin expressing? And you might not miss that from the ARB. What are the cells that express neuroregulin that would be affected by the cleavage if 
Yeah. yeah. So I didn't have time to talk about it, but um, the regulant can be expressed depends which the regulant. So there's 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 two two variations. So one of them is the major in the regulant is the regulant one, and that can form different isotypes that I showed you earlier by differential promoter. Those um, the norregulin one type one are mainly expressed at higher levels of GABA and neurons, but the type three is we're finding now is mainly expressed in cells that have long projections. Then they can be glutamatergic, even cholinergic cells have. Then there's other there's also other norregulants. So there's also norregulin two and norregulin three. Norregulin two again appears to be expressed like norregulin one, in, mostly in, in GABA and neurons, and and both of them actually accumulate. The first little picture that I showed, and I, unfortunately that is the that we have, but it didn't fit today's talk very well. But they accumulate very interestingly in a structure that very few people talk about. Uh, I think Treisman was here, so he might have told you guys about the structure. And you see these dots here? These are areas where norregulans accumulate. It's accumulating is an unprocessed protein. We've actually made antibodies. But the next intracellular, I mean, we know this is full of protein. This is called a, a subsurface cisterning. It's also a PMER site of contact. The regulin gets 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 targeted there, and then, in response to activity, this this structure comes apart. The regulin goes out, and then it gets cleaved by base and and, and gamma sequences. And there's evidence, but poor evidence, that the intercellular part of the regulins that go to the nucleus. But we personally have not been able, unless we do it. Artificially by overexpression, we never have got evidence that this happens in, in real sense. So, what's known about the kinetics of the uh, regulin cleavage and the affinity uh, of the regulin for the RP4? Is, is this stuff, those factors make sense with the signaling paradigm? How they very hard to measure. I mean, that's, I think, that's, that's what I'm trying to think if there's any experiment that can even address that question. So everything has been in vitro. So they have very high affinity constants. Very high. Very high affinity constants. So they're sitting. So if you look, um, the stuff I showed you was made in one animal. We've gone down to a 0 0.1 animal or 100 picomoles, and it still functions fine. Now it does have, it, it does have its max on an animal. Work. Um, but your question, I think, is directed more what is the in vivo concentration? The problem is there's not a single antibody out there that can do it. These are the first antibodies that are finally developed to these molecules. So we, this, this, we can finally see the endogenous protein. So but basically, on a general scale, you get activity, you start getting some cleavage. Are we talking about you need a very little bit of cleavage to do things in order to have an effect, or you need a massive? Yeah, that's a great question. So. What is the little one attack? All we know this far, and again, this is data that I did not show you. If, if you stimulate these cells, and it's interesting, you have to, stip, you have to it, it is an NMDA receptor dependent stimulation. These, these pumps will go away throughout the cell. But our stimulus yet are very, very strong. We're basically we're throwing NMDA or we're throwing in, you know, basically a high depolarization. We haven't yet done experiments where we can actually now stimulate the cell and see what what you know, what happens to these. It's, it's quite a difficult experiment to do because these guys are so sensitive. They also respond, for example, if you remove the cells from the incubator and you're not careful and you get any, like any oxygenation or anything, they actually also respond to stress. So they also go away from that. So it's hard. That question is very hard. Now, in vitro, that's been asked, okay. tested with receptor bodies and the protein. So they have affinities. That are again in the level of sub picomolar, um, and the, the rate constants are really high because of the offering. Great question. I love to answer it because it's again how you can fix some things. So one of the arguments, so so it's extremely difficult when you see an effect that is this strong and you, you see this like the so it's very strong with the Maybe it's just, it's just a little bit of early core left. Very difficult to show something's not there. And one of the arguments that people kept using 
because you know it wasn't good for us to show it's not there. I mean, I like all that things. <laughs> but one of the arguments they use is, I mean, you look at the brains, the spines on ligamentergic neurons are actually down. Well, guess what? They finally did the experiment they have to do. So now they've knocked out Irby 4 on the excitatory neurons by using the next one. Irby 4 in the inhibitory neurons. And guess who's the one that's satisfying you? Not the one of the moving children neurons. Again, you can get this indirect effect on the spines. And what you find in patients is that you actually have a reduction in spines. And a lot of people have attributed, oh, this must be a glutamatergic etiology. No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of literature that shows that not only GABAergic tongue, but also dopaminergic tongue can regulate this kind of thing. So when you're working on a slice and you're not working on a system outside, you have to worry about the neuromodulators that can be regulated in spine. Spine function size, and you can feel a mushroom versus the spine lead. They all are important. Additional questions? Sharon Grace will be very happy to entertain questions in full board.